matters. So more to come on that. So again, why does this keep happening? Global travel, climate change, urbanization, and I just want to bring up the fact that these are really neglected diseases that impact neglected whole populations that are generally poor. So these are really diseases of, of impoverished people, and I think it's important to, to talk about that and to know that and to do something about it. Um, we're constantly taken off guard because we have a very reactive and not proactive climate right now in media and funding, and we need to change that because there are a lot more scary diseases out there that no one's talking about that could easily come here and wreak havoc, and so we need to be better prepared. So in conclusion, arboviruses are quite common around the world. They're causing large outbreaks. Gigas and causally linked now to congenital defects. Large outbreaks can have devastating effects by both direct pathogen effects, which can be short-term and very long-term, as in the case of Zika, and by bystander effects of food, shelter, and care. Unfortunately, a lot of what we know for, about Zika comes from research a long time ago, and so there's a lot of research gaps that need to be addressed. Thank you. Thank you, Desiree. And um, at this point, I think we have a couple of minutes to take um, any questions that the audience might have. And if you would like to come up to the microphones and ask uh, a question or two, we have some time. Thank you, Lee. Hi. Yeah. Um, a question uh, mainly for David and Phil. Uh, I was visiting a uh, baby who was born yesterday. Uh, here at, at the nursery, uh, and his parents, one of, them, one of my best friends, were very excited about routine bio, uh, microbiome transplant for um, newborn infants. I'm wondering um, about your opinion on that, and the, the role, the current and future role of prophylactic microbiome transplant. Okay. Um, I'll make a quick comment. Um, I, I recognize um, a great deal of interest in trying to um, manage um, this, this interesting contributing factor to health and disease. And there's certainly a couple of very specific cases and settings in which management has proven to be um, effective in, in guiding the system back to a state of health. Those circumstances are, are quite limited in number, though, and I think it reflects the fact that we still don't understand, in fact, that topological landscape I showed and what it takes to shift a community from one stable state to another. Certain circumstances lend themselves quite, um, quite easily to manipulation and shift. Most do not, and, and many of Phil's colleagues and others around the world are now um, working in earnest to try to understand how do we modify that landscape and, and promote um, the kinds of shifts that we, we think are useful and, and yet don't yet know how. So, turn caution. Yes. Hi, thank you again for a great series of talks. Um, I had a follow-up question about Zika. So, um, is it, what is the state of thinking about how long Zika can um, remain in a host and potentially affect baby's brain. So for example, women who are in Brazil now are infected but not pregnant. Um, do they have to worry if they plan to get pregnant two months in the future, a year in the future? Yeah, so the understanding is, is that the reason why the fetus gets infected is because the mother gets bitten by the mosquito and the kid's by remix. So she has virus in her blood that then traffics to the placenta, uses axle to cross the placenta, so she black into the fetus and then gets to the neuroprocedural cells all during the period of viremia, which again is quite short, only about a, maybe a week at the, at the most. And so anybody who's a child during age who maybe gets Zika now shouldn't have any lasting effects from the virus, unless there are the unfortunate few that end up with Yandere or something like that. Otherwise, it should not r risk any future pregnancies for that mother. Yeah. Thank you. All right, well, thank you very much. I'd like to, again, thank the, um, our uh, wonderful panel of speakers. I think we have a couple, a couple of minutes to take um, any questions that the audience might have. And if you would like to come up to the microphones and ask uh, a question or two, we have some time. Thank you, Lee. Hi. Uh, yeah. um, a question uh, mainly for David and Phil. Uh, I was visiting a, a baby who was born yesterday. 
uh, here at, at the nursery, uh, and his parents, one of them, one of my best friends, were very excited about routine bio, uh, microbiome transplant for um, newborn infants. I'm wondering um, about your opinion on that and the, the role, the current and future role of prophylactic microbiome transplant. <laughs> I'll make a, me, a quick comment. Um, I, I recognize um, a great deal of interest in trying to um, manage um, this, this interesting contributing factor to health and disease, and there's certainly a couple of very specific cases in which management would be um, the system back to a state of health. Those circumstances are, are quite limited in number, though, and I think it reflects the fact that we still don't understand, in fact, that topological landscape I showed and what it takes to shift the community from one stable state to another. Certain circumstances lend themselves quite, um, quite easily to manipulation and shift. Most do not, and, and many of Phil's colleagues and others around the world are now um, working in earnest to try to understand how do we modify that landscape and, and promote um, the kinds of shifts that we, we think are useful and, and yet don't yet know how. So, so caution. Yes, go ahead. Hi, thank you again for a great series of talks. Um, I had a follow-up question about Zika. So um, is it, what is the state of thinking about how long Zika can um, remain in a host and potentially affect baby's brain. So for example, women who are in Brazil now are infections and not pregnant. Um, do they have to worry if they plan on getting pregnant two months in the future, a year in the future? Yeah, so the understanding is, is that the reason why the fetus gets infected is because the mother gets bitten by the mosquito and it's gets by remix. So she has virus in her blood that then traffics to the placenta, uses axle to cross the syncytial stroke glass into the fetus and then gets to the neuroprogenital cells all during the that period of viremia, which again is quite short, only about a, maybe a week at the, at the most. And so anybody who's a child growing age who maybe gets Zika now shouldn't have any lasting effects from the virus, unless there are the unfortunate few that end up with Yandere or something like that. Otherwise, it should not r risk any future pregnancies for that mother. Yeah. All right, well, thank you very much. I'd like to, again, thank you. Um, our uh, wonderful panel of speakers, and I um, encourage you to take a short break now, and I think we'll be back at 10.15, is that right? 10 to 10 to 10. All right, thank you very much. So our next speaker, we're very fortunate to have uh, Christina Bethel with us. Christina is the founding director of the Child and Adolescent Health Measurement uh, Institute uh, and the Department of Population, Family, and Reproductive Health at Johns Hopkins University. She also leads the National Data Resource Center for Child and Adolescent Health. Uh, if you're looking at any data that has to do with, with child health and adolescent health in this country, you're likely looking at, at data that uh, Christina has profoundly shaped. Um, she's one of the leading voices in, the, in developing collaborative approaches to using this data to shape systems that meet the needs of, of children, uh, adolescents, and families. Uh, Christina has a very provocative uh, talk for us looking at We Are the Medicine, Human Development, and Child Well-Being in an Era of Ordinary Magic. Christina. Great. Thank you. So thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to report to you from the alcove of maternal and child health epidemiology, where I've had the great opportunity to spend the last 20 or 25 years of my life uh, looking into what you might think of as the social genome of maternal and child and family health in this country. And my focus has been on figuring out how to measure what it is we're up to, what we care about and then also look at the performance and the functioning of the systems, the maternal and child health systems and programs that we fund to see if there's a connection. And also to try to insert measures to get a little bit ahead of the science and see whether what we hypothesize is making a difference actually looks like it's making a difference. 
life, family, and child relationships or adverse childhood experiences, which many people are talking about these days. And in the last couple years, my journey has taken me back east. I've been a West Coaster my entire life. And so it's taken me a little while to get adjusted, but just in the last month, I've become a proud owner of a Baltimore City grow home. And as I was preparing for this talk, the builder let me know that I have a nail in the table in the wall, so I can't get connected. And, you know, of course, he's really worried about it because he's going to have to rip the wall down and take the nails out, whoever put it together, and get me rewired. So I took this as an opportunity to respond to him. He's a child. He has two small children at home, and I said, and I said, to me, do you really need to be connected? Jokingly, and I said, yeah, I need to be connected. And did you know that we all need to be connected? And in fact, the most important, or well, one of the most important things to the well-being of your children is the safety, stability, and nurturing qualities of your relationship with them. And no matter what's going on in your life, that's always possible. That's always possible. And disruptions in those connections make it go haywire. And depending on what comes up along with those disruptions, to buffer, to protect us, to nurture us, sometimes we get nails in our cable and we can't get connected. And we have to rip the wall down and take the nails out and help restore connections. And this is really critical. And what we know, some of the types of experiences that can disrupt that safety and stability and nurturing quality of the relationship or what some people call adverse childhood experiences, which we're fortunate enough to measure nine of these on the National Survey of Children's Health. About half of children in the country experience one or more of these nine, and about 23% two or more. And while I was talking to the builder, I happened to actually have a young, magical child, who I will call Sweet Pea, with me this Saturday. And I've been spending time with her because she actually has experienced a lot of adverse childhood experiences. And some of the issues that she's dealing with are emotional, mental, and behavioral in nature. What we know from the data is that there's about five times greater odds of children who've experienced four or more adverse childhood experiences to have an emotional, mental, or behavioral issue. And CP has eight, an alcoholic mother. Uh, definitely divorce, economic hardship, mental health problems in the home, a father who is in jail, and other events like that. So the data in our epidemiologic world is very strong. Any one, which I've listed here, has about two times greater odds, up to two times greater odds. It's really the cumulative risk that is the biggest problem. So Stacey asked me, she said, I was talking to her about this talk, and she said, you know, can I write a poem? Because one of the things we do is a lot of poetry and art and movement, which are some of the things that we're finding are really helpful to children in learning. And I'm also teaching her mindfulness, which is something that I do on the side, is teach mindfulness. And so she wrote a poem, and I told her I would read it. I would recite it to you if I thought there was time or if it was appropriate. And based on our conversation so far, I think I will do that. So she calls the poem, Only Begins. I'm calling it my trauma-informed ode to epigenetics and the microbiome. <laughs> so here's, I'm just going to read two standards. So the first part is, I am in the world from her. I am in the world and the world is in me. From my toes to my nose to my belly to my knees. Within is out. Without is in. Endings can't be endings because there's only begins. And I thought, that's interesting. What do you mean by that? She said, well, that's what I call this, begins. I have to stay in the begins and, and not, not get stuck. But sometimes I get stuck. And I don't know I'm stuck because I'm stuck, and that's why I need to come and talk to you. Because you remind me and help me. I mean, need each other. And the parents can do that for their children if they can do it for themselves. So the second stanza, and then I'll stop there, is more about what begins are. She says, begins are like flowers that lean toward the light. When I'm aware of what's there, it's never really nice. Scary as the scary that just right from before. I'm almost never afraid of what's actually at my door. But when she's stuck, she can't see what's at her door. And that's why we keep working. So 
not everyone is able to give sweet tea. And what we're finding is that it's equally unequal. When you have exposure to adverse childhood experiences, you don't have. It's about 14.2% of all children in the country are having, being identified as having an emotional, mental, or behavioral problem. So not a problem. However, across all income groups, regardless, that rate is around 35 to 40%. Once you have four or more. So it's very true that if you're in a lower income group, you're much more likely to have a higher number of adverse childhood experiences. But once you have them and adjusting for everything we're able to adjust for, it's really uh, a common outcome. And unfortunately, we do see what you would expect. We measure flourishing, a very sort of low bar way of measuring flourishing. And even at that, we're seeing that across the continuum of cumulative risk for adverse childhood experiences. Uh, flourishing has a linear downward spiral as we're expecting. And of course, problems like having a special health care need, being obese, putting a, a, even a, overweight aside, just obesity, and special health care needs, and other such things that get up towards of 82%, 83% for children with four or more adverse health experiences. The income differential around this is not very wide. And the most important thing that we're finding, based on life course literature and some of the few things that have been able to be put in the national survey, is that maternal health matters. We indeed need to put the M back in maternal and child health, and also probably the S, maternal and child and family health. Um, so what we're finding is that if a child has no ACEs, about 68.3% of mothers are in S1 in very good health. If there's one, it's about 48. And if it's two or more, remember Sweet Pea had eight, 35.8%. And I can tell you, Sweet Pea's mom is not doing very well. That's why she comes to talk to me. And many, many other people. It's taking a village. So one year and two days ago, I was opening the panel in Baltimore for a healing forum to address these issues. And it took us about a year to put this forum together. And our panel was on the neuroscience, epigenetics, and social psychology of trauma, what it is, and how to heal it. And just as I was introducing the panel, which was April 20th, 2015, how many of you know what was going on on April around at that time in Baltimore? There were a lot of riots. And Freddie Gray, as of the evening before, was still alive. But that morning, everybody knew that he had died, and we were in a room with a sold-out crowd of 800. It was a community event, by the way. The police chief was in the room, the school superintendent, and many other people. So while there was trauma that day, there was also a sense of magic, what Ann Matson might call ordinary magic. So Ann Matson's come out with a book to synthesize what we know about resilience in childhood and in development. And this research began um, after World War II to really understand why it was that children who were exposed to similar types of experiences in the war, some were doing much better than others. So this research has been around for a very, very long time and is an opportunity for us to translate it. And now there's a whole neuroscience that supports the adaptive systems that she's summarizing with a lot of literature, so I encourage you to look at it. The first adaptive system is our relationships. And this is what I was talking about before. Effective caring for caregivers and connections to other competent caring adults. That's the core. That's first, actually. Before a child can learn their own capacity building, those relationships need to be 